a deep dive into South Korea's National Assembly election results with a good friend of the program, Ramon Pacheco Pardo, next on The Impossible State. North Korea is the impossible state. It's a place that stumped leaders and policymakers for more than three decades. It has a complex history, and it has become the United States' top national security priority. Each week on this show, we'll talk with the people who know the most about North Korea. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Impossible State podcast at CSIS. My name is Victor Cha, Senior Vice President for Asia, Korea Chair and Professor at Georgetown University. Uh, we're very happy to welcome back to the program today Ramon Pacheco Pardo to have a conversation about South Korea's recent uh, national election results uh, that took place last week. Um, Ramon, uh, again, is no stranger to the program, no stranger to CSIS. He's a professor of international relations at King's College London and is also the KFVUB Korea Chair at the Brussels School of Governance at the VUB in Brussels. So I have a pretty short commute between Georgetown and CSIS, but you have a slightly longer commute between Brussels and London. He is also the King's College Regional Envoy for East and Southeast Asia, an adjunct fellow with us here at the Korea Chair at CSIS. Uh, council member of the Alcano Royal Institute in Madrid, uh, and committee member at CSCAP. Uh, he is a prolific author. Uh, the, his most recent book is the one that we authored together, Korea, A New History, by Yale University Press. But he also has written, what is this? He's written three additional books in a period of four years. Uh, he's written South Korea's Grand Strategy, uh, published by Columbia in 2023, Shrimp to Whale, South Korea from the Forgotten War to K-Pop, uh, published by Hearst and Oxford University Press in 2022, and North Korea U.S. Relations uh, from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un, published by Rutledge in 2019. So a prolific, prolific author. Um, and so we're very happy to have you back on the program again, Ramon. It's a pleasure to be back here, Victor. <laughs> Thanks. So like I said, we're going to talk about these elections in South Korea that took place. Uh, and we have a little graphic to start us off to give people a sense of what, what changed during this period of time when um, South Koreans went to the polls. So this is what the, uh, the makeup looked like of the National Assembly in 2023. Uh, the blue represents the main opposition party in Korea, the Democratic Party. Uh, and the red represents the ruling party, the People Power Party. Um, and as we saw, the opposition party held 156 seats prior to last week's election. And the People Power Party held 114 seats uh, prior to the, the election. Koreans went to the polls last week, and the results were a victory for the, uh, de uh, for the opposition party. So if we go back to the overall uh, look here... Uh, again, they had 156 seats, the Democratic Party did, prior to the election. They increased that margin to 175 seats. Um, and then the ruling party uh, lost, uh, what is that, six? Six or seven seats uh, as a result of this election. And then there was also a splinter party, uh, the so-called Rebuilding Korea Party, which garnered, uh, garnered 12, uh, 12 seats. According to, um, so this was clearly a victory for the uh, opposition Democratic Party. Um, uh, I've been criticized on social media a bit because I said that I thought the international press was, um, were all sort of piling on using the same terminology, landslide, crushing defeat for the ruling party, uh, where, as we'll talk about, some of the benchmarks that really would have given uh, the Democratic Party, a great deal of power uh, were not met. Um, and a lot of people got angry at me for doing that, but, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, according to the latest uh, uh, polling that we've seen, um, <clears throat> the uh, Democratic Party still, I mean, even though they won this election, they still polled only 37% in terms of party support. The ruling party, even though they lost in this election, are only slightly lower at 33.6%. Uh, 
Um, and this was a survey that took place uh, this week. So, uh, and, and President Yun's approval rating is at 32%, so which is down about 5%, uh, and certainly not, um, well, I guess one could say par for the course in terms of his overall approval ratings. Uh, they've not been they've not been very good throughout his presidency. So um, let's talk about this, right, uh, Ramon? And I guess the first question I want to ask you is, you know, in your opinion, was this really was this a win for the opposition Democratic Party, or was it really a negative vote against the incumbent uh, uh, part, uh, the incumbent president, and the party? In, in my view, this particular election was more of the of the latter. There was a vote uh, against uh, the president himself uh, and against his his party uh, and we saw this in the run up to to the election in which uh, foreign policy was not really discussed at all it's not commonly discussed as we know in in, in Korean elections or any other countries el elections but in this case it was clearly about domestic politics and it was about the criticism that June president June is receiving uh, around many different uh, issues that we can discuss uh, in a second and I do think that uh, if we look at the uh, turnout, 67%, uh, which is the highest in 32 years mm. for a national assembly election, uh, I think this showed the, the, the passion that many Korean voters had and how they expressed this, this passion in giving a, a, a majority uh, to the DP. And then, uh, as you mentioned, there are other uh, left-leaning parties as well that uh, did quite, uh, quite well in this election. Uh, and, and that's why I, I lean more towards this second interpretation. There was more both of punishing uh, the policies pursued uh, by the president and also his leadership style, the, which has been uh, criticized uh, by many uh, Korean voters. Mm. Yeah, so um, I, I want to talk about the issues that were played in this election, but let's just talk a little bit more about the math of, of the election um, again, if we look at um, if we look at these uh, these these graphics we have up here, um, maybe you can tell explain to our readers, our, our listeners. So, as we said, the Democratic Party now has 175 seats, right? And then, if we look at the math, like an important number, I guess is one is it 185 or one 186 or something like that. Whatever is the uh, um, uh, the uh, um, what, well, well, you'll tell us why that's important, and then the ruling party didn't dip below a hundred seats, right? It's it's at at a hundred eight. So if we talk about the math here, uh, why is this important? Like, why is it important that um, uh, that we think about these numbers? Oh, and it's important to mention this splinter party, the Rebuilding Korea Party, has twelve seats, right? Um, and so how does this all matter in terms of the way the National Assembly works? Well, first of all, if there had been a, a two-thirds majority for the DP, so two, 200 seats of the, of the 300, and some polls actually, including exit polls, were predicting that they could get to this threshold, uh, they would have mean that uh, President Yoon have, wouldn't have had veto power because the National Assembly would have been able to override veto power, so it would have been able to legislate without the President being able to do uh, that much. Uh, there could have been an impeachment process, uh, and, and obviously with this two-third majority, President Jung would have been in, in, in big trouble because this could have actually uh, happened. So, so this two-thirds threshold, which also allows, by the way, uh, for, for uh, the Constitution uh, to, take, uh, to, to, to be reviewed, right? So certain articles in the Constitution as well. So the DP would have had a free hand, really, for the next uh, three years or even four years duration of this uh, National Assembly, the four-year duration to uh, be able to legislate without the president being able to, to do much and his own position would have been uh, in doubt. Now, if we go down to, to 180, right? right. Uh, three fifths uh, of, of, of the 300 seats, uh, this would have uh, also allowed the DP by itself to have uh, uh, the initiative uh, when it comes to uh, legislation. Yes, this could have been vetoed by uh, the president uh, in this case, but those leaders would have taken a political toll. If you have the National Assembly constantly passing uh, new legislation and the president constantly vetoing it, right? So it would have been an issue as well. And this is where it becomes interesting because as you were showing, right, we have the rebuilding um, uh, Korea party led by, by, by Chaeguk, the, the former uh, Minister of Justice under President Moon, 
uh, who uh, in his time in office, uh, he uh, uh, went on trial. And this was when President Jung himself was the prosecutor, right? A prosecutor that was leading on, on, on the investigation. So he has this personal animosity towards you and the President June and vice versa, right? Uh, you, saw, you see it has 12 seats. So if you add the 12 seats that he has with the 175 that the DP uh, has, you get over this uh, 180 seat uh, threshold. But that means that this gives him a lot of power mm. because the DP will have to sit down and talk to him. And interestingly, recently, uh, Chegu has actually said that he's willing to talk to other parties, he's also willing to talk to the PPP, and he's willing to talk, sit down and talk to President Yoon. So we, ha we see now that this being a small party that was only formed prior to this election, but you have a leader who is very popular among liberals uh, in Korea, right? Uh, and he can conceivably be try to be the next uh, liberal candidate uh, for the next presidential election that we'll have in three years, as opposed, for example, Lee chae who is the leader of the, uh, of the DP. So the politics of it and how the numbers have turned out means that you have a smaller party that, again, didn't exist uh, a few months ago, that now you could argue can become kingmaker uh, in the National Assembly. Yeah, yeah, so that's interesting. Well, we, again, so if we look at the math of this rather than the politics of it, you know, a, a true landslide or crushing defeat would have been if the Democratic Party had broken the 180 threshold or even the 200 threshold, where they could have effectively completely sidelined the incumbent president and basically, or, or even could have impeached him, mm -hmm. right? And they could even change the Constitution. The president would have no veto power uh, whatsoever. Uh, but what actually happened was, in the end, the DP got more seats, but they didn't cross that threshold. Um, and now you have this party. I mean, if there was a real winner in this election, it's really Choguk and this re re rebuilding Korea party who now um, the DP needs to get over that threshold in order to be able to govern in ways that would be not just obstructive to the administration, but actually be able to advance an agenda through legislation that they wouldn't have been, they have not been able to do thus far. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the National Assembly. Um, um, and then the other thing is, if we look at the math, is if the DP, the Democratic Party, with 175 seats, if they were able to get the support of uh, all the other non-PPP winners in the election, so it's the Rebuilding Korea Party, it's this Reform Party, it's this Progressive Party, if they pulled all of these together would that take them over the? Uh, that would take them certainly over 180, 180. But it would take them. Would that take them over the two hundred mark or not? That, that gets them to one ninety two. I see. Right, okay. and and it has to be said that uh, there are liberal parties here, but also conservative parties. Right. Having said that, it doesn't mean that the conservative parties are going to side with the PPP because there were splinter parties from the PPP. Right. So it becomes, I think, more complicated than saying, well, left leaning parties, right leaning parties. And they're going to be uh, the left-leaning parties working together in the National Assembly. Not necessarily, because within the left-leaning bloc, there are different parties, right? And some of them, uh, they don't really get along uh, with the DP. And they came out actually as splinter parties from the DP. And same on the conservative side, uh, we have uh, politicians who were not happy with the way the PPP was being run. And they decided that they would run independently and they were able to be elected to the National Assembly. So I think that's something that we'll have to pay attention to, the divisions within the two camps, and not only the 192 for all the parties that could be argued are in the opposition, and the 108 that you see for the, for the PPP. Uh, and as you know, even within the PPP, there are many uh, lawmakers elected now who are not happy with President Jun's leadership. So, so they will also be uh, basically looking at whether they can be the next presidential candidate for the party, and that doesn't mean necessarily that they will support uh, President Jun's uh, policy agenda. But also in the DP, uh, there are many lawmakers who would like to remove uh, Lee Chae-myung, right, uh, the leader of the party, from his position, so they can actually be the next presidential candidate or run the party mm. until the next presidential election. I think we'll have to pay attention to this as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, let's actually talk about some of the issues. Like, the... It, this um, this election, you know, was clearly about uh, power in the legislature. But what I mean, what were the issues at play that you think motivated voters um, either to vote for the DP or to, for, or to vote uh, for the for the ruling party? And also, 
Um, there were a bunch of late, uh, late breaking issues uh, that were taking place, the doctor strike, um, the whole question of, of releasing more real estate, uh, previously restricted real estate for development, and some scandals. So maybe you could uh, explain to our listeners what were some of these issues that were at play during the election. So I think we had some long-standing uh, issues, meaning since President Jun was elected, he, he has been accused of not running uh, his office as a politician would do, which means talking to the opposition or even talking to lawmakers in his own party. He has been accused of following this uh, prosecutorial approach uh, based on, on his long, long-standing and successful career, really, as a, as a prosecutor. Uh, so he's taking, uh, according to his critics, uh, this confrontational approach, not willing to sit down with the opposition, not willing to go to the National Assembly to try to garner enough votes for his signature policies uh, when it comes to domestic uh, policies. So it was this issue of a style. Uh, there is also this issue of um, uh, his wife uh, having been accused of, of, of corruption. For example, there's this uh, video that has made the rounds in, 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 in Korean social media and also traditional media, where, where she's receiving a, a, a luxury uh, handbag and, and, and she keeps it. Uh, and we know what has happened with the, with, with the handbag, but obviously this is not uh, legal under uh, Korean uh, legislation. She has also been accused of plagiarizing uh, her PhD thesis, and she has been clear of this, but many uh, people in the opposition and even in the conservative camp uh, think that this shouldn't have been the case. So there's the style, there's the corruption issues uh, that uh, have been raised uh, by the opposition, but also, as you were saying, more recent issues. Uh, if we look at the uh, doctor strike, so for listeners who uh, and viewers who don't know, uh, basically the, the government announced that it was going to increase and the number of places in medical school, which I think Korea really uh, needs, especially in rural areas, to have more, more, more doctors. So the policy itself, in the beginning especially, was supported by a majority of, 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 of voters uh, in, in, in Korea. And actually, this helped to boost um, the approval rate of, of, of the president. But then it turned out that this hadn't been discussed uh, with doctor associations to begin with, with medical schools. Uh, this hadn't been discussed with the opposition. Uh, and even within the, the party, uh, the PPP, the Conservative Party, there was that, that were surprised by this announcement, right? So again, this goes back to Isha Dias mentioned, for many, President Yu is not willing to sit down and discuss policy before it is actually announced, so to reach a consensus. So this turn against him, as we saw the strikes continuing for many weeks, really, we saw that uh, non-emergency medical procedures were being cancelled or were being postponed. Uh, and, 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 and we saw that there was no willingness to sit down and say, OK, well, I have announced uh, 2,000 extra places uh, in medical schools. Is this the right number? Do we need more or do we need less? Uh, how can we implement this? Because it has been announced that it will start already this year. So, so this fall, potentially, we could have two more thousand uh, future doctors uh, being be, being trained, but again, this hasn't been discussed. For example, with medical schools and the teachers who actually have to teach these doctors who would have to work more. Mm -hmm. So that became a big issue. There was also a, a, a visit to a market in which uh, President Jung commented how how how, how cheap uh, uh, green onions uh, were, and it turned out that it was a subsidized market, right? So uh, it's not only in Korea. I mean. Uh, in the UK, it's the same. You know, when politicians go to markets, to supermarkets, they don't necessarily know the prices because they don't do their own shopping in many cases, yeah, right? It's a bad move. It's, it's a, bad just move. a bad move. It's yeah. a bad move, right? Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, voters note it doesn't say, well, uh, the president doesn't know the, 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 the prices of staples that we all have to buy. And we have noticed the increase in, in the inflation in, 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 in Korea as well. So this also became an issue. And real estate has been a long standing issue. But again, uh, this was announced by the government, new policies to try to uh, lead to the, to, the, to the building of more uh, flats in the case of, of, of Korea, more housing uh, provision. But again, it seemed that this hadn't been discussed uh, certainly with opposition, but even within the party. So again, this went back to the narrative that President Yoon doesn't want to sit down and talk uh, to others, right? Uh, and sometimes that he's too stubborn. So regardless of whether you agree or disagree with this, it's clear that the majority of Korean voters think that this is actually the case, and, and this really hurt him uh, in the run-up to the election, and by extension, the PPP also also suffered. Yeah, yeah, the, the green onion one in particular was pretty bad. I mean, I, I'm not a political consultant by any means, but the one thing that's pretty clear is if you're the incumbent, right, if you're the incumbent, the opposition's always going to uh, paint you as being 
elitist and and sort of in a bubble. Mm -hmm. And so the worst thing you can do as an incumbent in a campaign is show up at a market yes. uh, because you clearly have not been doing any of your shopping yourself. I remember long ago in U.S. politics, there was a case of an incumbent that went uh, and was uh, astonished at so how the uh, the cash the checkout cashier was using barcodes to scan uh, the price of goods, <laughs> and he, he thought that that was just amazing. Where for every American, that was just a part of their life. So um, in so the UK, it's a pint of milk. What's the price of a pint it of was milk? A pint of milk yes. in, UK, yes. in the UK. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Um, so uh, so that's the advice that Ramon and I can give to future incumbent. Politicians don't visit a market on the campaign <laughs> trail. Um, so I guess, you know, one serious question, though, is, is, you know, as we know, South Korea has a single five-year term presidency. He's now finishing year two. He's got three more years to go. President Yoon does. With this loss in this election, um, is he now effectively a lame duck? I, I don't think so. I mm -hmm. don't think so. Uh, mm -hmm. A, because when it comes to foreign policy, and we can discuss a bit more about this later on, really the president can take, he can call the shots, right? And he has been doing this, uh, let's not forget, uh, he was facing a minority in the National Assembly for the past two years. So this is not new to him. And he has been calling the shots when it comes to foreign policy. Now, when it comes to domestic politics, we'll have to see, because mm -hmm. President Yun now has said that he's going to change his leadership uh, style. He's going to make major changes uh, in his cabinet. Mm. So he may decide that it is in his interest to actually sit down and talk to the opposition, talk even to his own party, to try to get some signature measures uh, approved by the National Assembly on, 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 on matters that relate to economic policy making, uh, to reform of the uh, social uh, welfare state uh, in, in, in Korea when it comes to support for innovation. And I say this, and, and, and many don't agree with me, but many actually do, that when it comes to major issues, when it comes to economic policy making, you don't see major difference between the liberals and the conservatives. Support for innovation, uh, semiconductors, uh, biotech, AI, 80, 90 percent of South Korean legislators agree that this is in the interest of Korea. They may disagree on what type of support you want to provide, how long this support should be for, how much money you may want to give. But, but they're arguing really about the smaller issues. They're not arguing about the big issue, which this is necessary. If you look at the reform of the uh, welfare state in Korea, which most Koreans agree is, is, is necessary, this has been pursued by both liberals and conservatives over the past 20 uh, 20 plus years. Uh, now in Korea, uh, one of the big debates is uh, the, the low birth rate. Uh, what can we do to increase it, right? And you don't see major differences in terms of policy between liberals and conservatives. They, 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 think, they think alike about what would be necessary to, to raise it. Now, I think you would need to have more dialogue uh, between the president and the opposition because otherwise the opposition has no incentive to support the policies uh, of the president which in a sense they probably would be their own policies if they were in power, right? But obviously they're in the, the opposition. Now, if uh, this doesn't change uh, and we follow this approach of not really discussing with the opposition or even within their own party what policies to pursue, not necessarily a lame duck, but clearly it would be very difficult for any policy measure that the president uh, wishes to pursue to be approved by the National Assembly. So I think a style is really uh, going to matter uh, for the next uh, for the next three years, but at the very least the next year and a half, two years, because obviously in, in one year and a half, two years, we'll be talking about the next presidential election. And then it's true that in the last year of the presidency, it's more difficult for the National Assembly to give any, to, to allow the, the uh, June or his party to score any points. Yeah, yeah. Um, so on, let, let's talk a little bit about foreign policy then. I mean, they, um, um, you mentioned that the uh, uh, Korean president has more leeway on foreign policy than domestic policy. Um, your thoughts on, you know, how this will affect his policies towards the alliance, towards Japan, mm -hmm. towards Europe, um, where uh, South Korea is playing a big role in the war in mm -hmm. Ukraine, um, these sorts of things. I mean, it is interesting to note that... Um, there are some newcomers who mm -hmm. won seats in this national assembly election who are, uh, you know, major for foreign policy hands, like uh, Wee Sung Lak, mm -hmm. right, who was former ambassador to Russia, formerly um, head of the South Korean side for the six-party talks 
with North Korea, was I think also national security advisor on the campaign for uh, for Lee Jae Myung as well. So he now has a seat. Kim Gunn, who was um, the uh, senior envoy for Six Party Talks, foreign ministry diplomat, professional, also has garnered a seat. Uh, Pak Jin, the former foreign minister, um, uh, someone we know well, um, mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately lost his, lost in his bid to uh, transition from uh, the UN government's top diplomat to returning to the National Assembly, where he'd been a politician before. But what what are your thoughts on sort of these issues, the alliance, mm-hmm. Japan, uh, a- and Europe? For, for me, a starting point is that if you look at domestic politics, but also uh, where Korea is in the world, there are structural constraints to what a- any president can do. So you have 90% of Koreans support the alliance. I have a favorable view of the U.S. 80% more or less have a negative view of China. D- this constrains decision-making for, for any president, really. Yeah. But also if you look at this, uh, when it comes to the Korea's position in international affairs, there is a growing demand on Korea to intervene, for example, in supporting Ukraine when it comes to Russia's invasion. To have a say in issues in the Middle East, for example, in the past, Korea could, could argue, well, there's nothing lost for our country there. Uh, even if you look at this so-called G7+, plus, right, the reason why Korea has been discussed as a potential uh, member of an expanded G7 is because it gets along very well with the G7 members, and increasingly well with the G7 members, uh, including Japan, it has to be said, right? Mm-hmm. So there are these uh, structural issues that any Korean president has to pay attention to, this growing demand on Korea to deliver public goods way beyond the Korean peninsula. And I start with this because... I do think that President Jun will continue the same policy because he personally believes in this policy. Uh, also because one of the few advantages that I see with having a non-renewable five-year term in Korea, I think we'd better to have something similar to the US, but we don't have it in Korea, is that a president can run his or her uh, foreign policy without having to think about re-election. And this can lead to decisions that may be seen as unpopular, but in this case, President Jun doesn't have to think about, well, will I be voted in or out on the next election? That's not an option uh, for him. Mm-hmm. So I think he's going to double down uh, on his policies. I think Korea is going to be asked, whoever wins the election here in the U.S., uh, we have European Parliament elections, of course, in the European Union as well. There are elections taking place in, in countries such as the, the U.K. Uh, coming up as well over the next year. Korea is going to be asked to contribute more for example, to support Ukraine, as I mentioned before, to deter China or to be involved in discussions about how to deal with China, or is it there's a whole North Korea debate in which Korea itself has reached out to the U.S. Uh, at the U.N., but also the bilateral level to garner a group of countries that are going to allow Korea, the U.S., other countries to uh, continue to implement the sanctions, monitor the sanctions on uh, North Korea now that we have seen what happened in the UN Security Council with Russia uh, vetoing yeah. uh, the extension uh, right of the 1718 uh, uh, panel, 1718 panel, right? So, so I do think that it will continue the same course. Uh, and I actually have to say, I think that if President Yoon finds that this very difficult or continues to be very difficult, maybe that's the exact term, to implement his preferred domestic politics, so that has been the case over the past two years, he will say, well, I'll just focus on foreign affairs because Korea is in demand. We see the number of state visits by the president to uh, other countries in in, in Europe, in the Middle East, obviously here in in the US as well. You see foreign leaders uh, visiting uh, Korea. I mean, I I come from Europe. We have seen the the, uh, Dutch prime minister, Spanish prime minister uh, visiting uh, Korea. There's a presidential visit that coming to, to Germany. There's a past one to the Netherlands. There was a past one to uh, to the UK as well. So Korea is in demand uh, because of its business people, because of a strong defense industry, uh, because of participation in this G7 plus uh, framework that I that I mentioned previously. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't see I, I don't see this changing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that um, as you said that. Um, on on domestic policy, uh, there'll be a there'll be a lot of wrangling that takes place on domestic policy. But they're they're in many ways they're arguing over the same issues, right? How to improve growth, how to mm. create innovation, how to, how to help, help small and medium sized enterprises, how to in, improve in, you know increase full employment, 
um, and not just part-time jobs. Uh, you know, there, there are many similar things. But on foreign policy, where I think you're right, Yoon will basically continue on the path that he's on because it's a path that he created when he was already in the minority and was already unpopular, so he's just going to continue because he believes in it, as you said. But there, there could be very big differences on foreign policy. So if, for example, the DP um, garners, uh, 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 you know, gets to 180 where they, they can then fast-track bills and things, or even if they got to 200 or over 200, they could try to push a completely different foreign policy, right? During the campaign, Lee Jae-myung and some other people, you know, did not approve of the policy on Japan, actually called for neutrality on Ukraine, right? And, pro and obviously they have big differences on policy towards North Korea. So, um, so there could be very big differences that would have been impacted in terms of foreign policy by the results of, of this election. So that's an interesting point. I mean, uh, I've been criticized for making the point that I'm about to make. Uh, I think someone like Isun Lak, for example, that, as you mentioned, he is now uh, uh, in, in the National Assembly. And it's true, he was the lead foreign policy, national security um, um, policy advisor to, to, to yes, uh, yeah. Itemion, who was candidate, right? <laughs> He's center left. <laughs> He's center center, as some mm -hmm. would say, actually, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've talked to him. Um, you met him many times. I'm, I'm, of course, I know you, you. You have. I've been able to meet with him and discuss foreign policy with him. And he's someone that you wouldn't be surprised if he's serving a conservative administration, sure. right? And for me, that's an interesting thing. Same same with Kim Gunn. I mean, Kim Gunn, yes, uh, center right, but. If he served in a center-left administration, he wouldn't necessarily be out of place yeah. there. Yes, no. it's true. There are other um, National Assembly members that have been elected that have more uh, leftist views, right? Yeah. The more yeah. traditional leftist view yeah. of we're brothers with North Korea and the U.S. is to blame, right. uh, clearly, right? So there's yeah. a debate there. So I always take with a pinch of salt or a grain of salt, really, what is said in a campaign, right? When you're trying to undermine the policy of the opposition. Yeah. I would like to see if a liberal president comes to office, whether they would be able to follow this this policy. And I honestly have, have doubts, among other reasons, because of the constraints that I mentioned. From the public. From the public. Yeah. I mean, if you want to run a policy that undermines the alliance and becomes closer to China, well, you have 80, 90 percent of the population, I would say, well, we don't necessarily yeah. like this. And And I think that in a democracy, that should matter. And personally, I think to an extent, it, it, it matters. But there are many, probably a majority, that would agree with you instead of me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they would say, well, there could be a big change if the, if the liberals had had this, this super majority, for example, that they didn't, yeah. uh, they, they didn't achieve. And something very interesting we did at my chair back in, in Brussels in the run-up to the campaign. For the first time ever, we actually asked the candidates about the policy towards Europe. Right, mm -hmm. the two mm -hmm. campaigns. Right, uh, President Yoon before he became president, uh, uh, Lee Chang as well, uh, and we asked him about EU, NATO, Europe. Right, and their answers were fairly similar. Mm -hmm. As we said, mm -hmm. we, we have this online actually. If anyone's interested, they can go to our website. It was like, whoa, what's the difference here between both of them? And I, and the answers came from the foreign policy teams. Obviously, the, back then the candidates wouldn't sit down and answer our questions, but the foreign policy teams. Sure, and that's what I find interesting mm -hmm. that. I doubt that a Korean president can have a free reign in foreign policy. It could be the case yeah. in the past. North Korea is a different matter, of course, right? Uh, North Korea, yeah. it would be different, but then it has to be said, I mean, dealing with the current North Korea, how much leeway do you have to pursue a policy of engagement like the one we saw, not even under Moon, but the one we saw, for example, in, in, in 2000 and, you know, in the... Um, first two liberal administrations, right, in which you clearly saw a pro-engagement policy, might be more difficult today than it was in the past, really, because of North Korea's stance. Yeah, right, right, because, of, I mean, they may want to pursue it, but because of North Korea's stance these days, uh, when they're not willing to talk to anyone, it seems, except China and Russia, it might be very, it might be very difficult. Okay, let me, can, um, can we, uh, as a final thing, just talk about some of the notable... Um, um, uh, winners and losers in the in the in the race, and sort of just get your thought uh, thoughts. So you know some of the big political heavyweights I want. Obviously, Lee Jae Myung, right, um, former mm -hmm. former candidate. Uh, An Chul Su, one. Mm -hmm. uh, Chu Mie, mm -hmm. right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Lee Jun Sok, right. Mm -hmm. So we have political heavyweights from both the left and the right. 
um, with with big wins. And then also the return of Na Gyeong Won. Right, mm-hmm. Na Gyeong Won mm-hmm. is back now uh, after having won her race. So uh, really, on both sides, political heavyweights uh, are back uh, or reelected or are returning. Um, um, which um, I think, you know, on the DP side, it's very clear who wants to run next time. <laughs> but it really is an open field, an right, open field. on the conservative side, because one of the results of this election is that the leader of the party, the so-called, I mean, he was sort of the fair-haired child, you know, the anointed one who was likely to succeed, has had to resign because of the loss. So it's kind of an open field now, and you have all these other people who are who are there. Um uh, Foreign Prime Minister uh, Lee Nak uh, lost, right? Uh, Pak Jin, as we said, lost. And then Tae Young Ho also, mm-hmm. the uh, the famous sort of North Korean escapee turned polit- South Korean politician, uh, uh, also also lost. So, any thoughts on uh, first on that that group? Any thoughts on on those or? I mean, I, I think the election really reinforces uh, Lee Chae-myung's position, as we said, because let's not forget, many within his party don't want him to be the next president of Kaldini, and they even blame him mm. for the very narrow uh, victory that President Yoon had in the last election. They said, we have had a more center-left candidate, or less controversial candidate, right, from his time as, as governor of uh, Gyeonggi-do, right, right, that they would have won, because uh, the difference was so small. But now he can say, I delivered. Uh, and yes, he's in legal trouble. We see where it is in two, three years' time, his legal troubles, right? But he has a strong hand saying, well, I delivered. I only lost the election, the past election, by a very small margin, so I do deserve to run mm. for president. I would like to see someone like uh, Teo, for example, says, I'm going to try the leadership of the DP. Mm. Right? Uh, he doesn't have to, he has his own party, but as we know in Korea, yes, the parties change their names, but we have the two big parties, liberal, conservative, and, and they are the ones uh, that, that will run in candidates that have a strong possibility of being the next president. So, so let's see where he is. Uh, again, despite his legal troubles, but even if he has a two years uh, prison sentence uh, that he has to serve, he, this still would mean that he would be in time to run for um, mm. uh, the leadership of the party. Uh, next time, uh, next time around, I think on the conservative side, it, it is an open field. Uh, it has to be said, uh, because as you said, uh, we thought we have a clear candidate, the leader of the uh, PPP, and he's gone. And now we have uh, big personalities who are going to be maybe not the next year, but clearly in, in a year and a half or so. We are going to start to see who are the ones that uh, have a strong possibility of becoming the next president. I think we'll see many of them interested running against Jun, not only against the opposition. Mm. And this is not new in Korea. Uh, when Park Geun-hye, for example, uh, became president after Lee Moon-bak, two conservative presidents from the same party. But Park, during her campaign, she was running really against Lee Moon-bak as much as she was running mm. uh, against the liberals. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see we, the, the same on the conservative side. Say, look, uh, yes, I'm from the same party as President June, but I'm from another wing uh, of the party. So I want to see how different heavyweights position uh, the, the themselves. Uh, but as I said, I, I think it's a bit early uh, at this point uh, in time. We'll see who becomes the next leader uh, of the PPP. We'll see whether there is a challenge for the leadership of the DP. I still think there will be a challenge mm. to the leadership of the DP, especially if these legal troubles that uh, Lee Chae-myung is facing uh, become more serious. And yeah. uh, for yeah. example, he, yeah. he's prosecuted and has to go uh, on trial. Uh, and and, and, and I, I would be surprised <laughs> if uh, we know over the next year who are going to be the candidates. I think we'll go to it one year and a half, two years, and then we'll have a clear, clear picture. What I do think we'll see is that there will be many candidates on the conservative side. Yeah. Five, six, seven candidates that potentially could be the next leader of the party and therefore run uh, the next candidate that runs for for election, the next presidential election. As I said, I want to see on the liberal side where it's actually people who are outside of the DP, who, whether they'll remain outside, starting with Cheguk, or they go 
into the AP because they don't have a bigger chance of becoming president if they're actually part of one of the mainstream parties. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so just to finish, one, uh, I think it's, I mean, unfortunately, it's worth noting that what we see going forward is that, um, look, as I said, the, the, right now, the support for after this election, right after this election, support for the DP is at 37%, support for the PPP, basically at 30, 34%. If you factor in a margin of error there, then you're not really talking about a, much of a difference. And so that means political polarization will probably deepen going forward. Right. I mean, the conservatives will want to try to take down both Lee Jae-myung and Cho Guk on corruption charges. The opposition will go after the president's wife. Um, not not a pretty picture, I think, going forward. But then the other thing that's, I guess, on the positive side to say is that, you know, this, these are fiercely fought elections, right? Fiercely fought competitions. Um, the last presidential election was a razor thin victory. But is it true that for the most part, South Korean politicians, consultants, voters themselves, they don't question the system, right? They don't, they don't question the process. You know, there's always concerns about misinformation, disinformation from outside actors and others. But overall, they, on, in this election, did in the end, were there questions about the process, about the electoral system or anything like that? That's an excellent question yeah. to raise because the answer is no. I mean, you yeah. see an acceptance of the system, right? And across the board, really, uh, candidates in the losing side, uh, in this case, the, the, the Conservative Party uh, as a whole, the PPP, they do accept the verdict from the voters. Yeah. Uh, and I think that matters because that's not necessarily the case. Uh, no one to talk about the places? US. I don't know where you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't want to say anything in your home, <laughs> home ground, right? <laughs> But 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 even in in, in in Europe now you see certainly some 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 question in some countries in Central Eastern Europe you know are are these clean elections uh, or, or or not right and it is concerning uh, and you see this in in Korea which is good to see that the losing party accepts this even as you said in the last presidential election we're talking a racial thin margin less than one yeah. percent but you didn't see for example in this case the dp asking for a recount of the votes or saying oh this is due to russian interference or north korean interference or chinese uh, interference uh, in the electoral uh, in the electoral process that led to the victory of the of the ppp and, and, and president yoon uh, and i think that matters that koreans continue to accept this and i don't think polarization is going away i think as you were saying is one third of the voters on the conservative uh, side, one third on the liberal side, and one third, we don't know, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Or they have a preference for a smaller parties, or, or uh, they're more towards the center, they don't particularly support one or the other party. So it's not only about the two big uh, movements, right, or, or parties in Korea, it's also about the one third that don't feel represented by any of these two, but they don't question the system, right? They, they don't say, well, why do the big two uh, have to have this uh, the largest share of the vote, right? If one third is voting for other parties or abstaining, that's how the system works, and, and they do they do accept it. Uh, and I think that matters uh, among other things because we have talked a lot in the past about Korea as an economic model for many developing countries, but now increasingly it is in as a political model yeah. for countries that are suffering from democratic backsliding, or even countries in which the people would like to transition to a full democracy, which, which, which Korea, Korea is, right? Uh, and the electoral process, the integrity of the electoral process is, is key to this, and, uh, and Korea, you could argue some model when it comes to, to this integrity. Yeah, and apropos that, they just hosted the Democracy Summit yes. uh, last month in Seoul. So um, anyway, uh, Ramon, thank you so much for being on the show again, and uh, really a great discussion about South Korea's National Assembly election results. Um, so again, that was Ramon Pacheco Pardo, uh, professor at King's College and the European Union Korea Chair, joining us here at CSIS. Thank you all for watching and listening to the program, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Impossible State.